Hello YouTube. In this video we're going to look at the problem of personites. This was first presented by uh, Mark Johnston in his article The Personite Problem and it raises some interesting challenges for our conventional ways of thinking about morality and practical reason. Um, so, first of all, quick advert, if you like my channel, you can support me on Patreon or with a one-off donation on PayPal. Uh, if you're interested in private tutoring, I do offer that, so send me an email about that. And feel free to join the Discord if you want to talk about any of these topics with other people. Okay then, let's get going. The personite problem. So, first of all, <clears throat> what exactly is a personite? Well, consider the lifetime of a whole person. A person is born, lives for some time, and then dies. So imagine the timeline of your whole life from birth to death. Let's say that you make it to 72. This is then going to represent the life of a whole person. But now we can select just part of this timeline. So take the same timeline of a life and consider the life up to, but not including, the final year. So we consider the life up to the age of 71, right? Like, so this, so the person lives to 72, but we're just considering the lifetime up to the age of 71. This is a personite. It's something very much like a person, but its existence ends a year before biological death. So, as Johnston defines it, a personite is a shorter-lived, person-like thing extending across part, but not the whole, of a person's life. Of course, whenever a person exists, indefinite numbers of personites exist. Uh, some personites exist for just a single second, some personites exist for years. Any time you select part of a person's life, this is a personite. The life of a person overlaps with the lives of countless personites. Uh, now, of course, personites are rather strange entities. Um, I mean, on the sort of common sense view, we would usually think that over the lifetime of a person, there's just one person-like thing, you know, namely the person. Uh, but, um, it, I, I mean, what we're saying is that, like, in my body right now, there's not just me, there's this indefinite number of other person-like things. But, I mean, actually, the, the, the thought here is really very straightforward, right? It's, we're just saying that, so a personite is part of the lifetime of a person. Um, you know, so if we were to say that persons exist, but that personites do not exist, that would be rather like saying that hands exist, but then fingers don't exist. We're just considering, you know, just with respect to the temporal parts, right? So a person exists over a particular period of time and we're just taking part of that. Now, this leads to the personite problem because it seems as though uh, personites are going to have moral status in the same way that persons do. Um, personites are very, very similar to persons. Um, so, if persons matter, then so do personites. Um, indeed, note that many personites would have been persons if the circumstances had been slightly different. So, there is a personite corresponding to Verity's lifetime up to the age of 30. We can call this personite Verity Minus. Verity survives past the age of 30, but she could have been killed on her 30th birthday. In that case, Verity Minus, the personite who ceases to exist on Verity's 30th birthday, Verity Minus would have been a person. Um, the only reason why Verity Minus does not count as a person is because of what happened after she ceased to exist. So what happened after Verity Minus ceased to exist is that there was this continuation of bodily and psychological continuity. <coughs> And, you know, that's why, right, that's why we say that Verity Minus is not a person. Um, but Verity Minus seems to have all of the properties that we think are important to the moral status of persons. Verity Minus has exactly the same thoughts and feelings that Verity has prior to the age of 30. Verity Minus can suffer, she can reason, she can experience joy, she can hope and fear for her future and so on. I mean, in some sense, we might say that personites are, are, are more fundamental than persons because persons are made up of personites. The only way that a person can suffer or reason or act or do anything else is because of what the personites that make up that person do. I mean, if Verity Minus did not think or feel or have emotions, then 
like how could Verity have done those things? Um, so, you know, the, the, so the question then here is, well, under what conditions does an entity have moral status? Obviously, this is a topic of great debate. Um, and, you know, different people give different answers here. Maybe uh, what matters to moral status is the capacity to reason, you know, to engage in rational thought. Or maybe it's the capacity to suffer. Um, or maybe the capacity to form connections with others. Uh, but whatever we say here, it looks like personites have all of these. So the suggestion is that, look, whatever it is that makes persons worthy of moral consideration is also going to be true of personites. Um, and I, I guess there's a, a sort of general principle that we can draw on here, which would say something like, if some entity X has moral status then any being that is at some time psychologically and behaviorally indistinguishable from X uh, also has moral status at that time. Like, if you can't find any distinction, you know, uh, in, in terms of the psychology or behavior or whatever between two beings, then, like, either they both have moral status or neither of them do. Um, so, if persons matter, so do personites. And indeed, more strongly, personites matter to the same degree that persons do. They should be afforded the same respect and the same moral consideration as persons. Um, so what we want to say is, well, you know, a being's moral status should not depend on what happens or what will on what will happen after that being has ceased to exist or indeed before that being has come into existence. But if this is right, then personites have the same moral status as persons. Again, the only reason why Verity Minus is not a person is because of what happens after she ceases to exist. Um, and then there are the personites who come into being in the later stages of a person's life. So there's the personite who came into to existence on Verity's 20th birthday and continues to exist until her death. Again, being's moral status shouldn't depend on what happens prior to its coming into existence. These later stage personites have just as much capacity to reason, just as much capacity to think and feel and to form connections with others and so on, as persons do. Um, okay, the suggestion then is it would be objectionably arbitrary to privilege persons over personites. To deny that personites matter would be analogous to racism, sexism or speciesism. Um, I mean, we, we recognise that there are, you know, OK, yes, there are differences between persons and personites, but those differences are not morally relevant in the same way. Yeah, we can draw a distinction between people on the basis of skin colour. There is a difference there. Some people have darker skin than others, but that's not a morally relevant property. Um, similarly, the mere fact of being a particular gender or having a particular type of DNA, those are not morally relevant. Um, and, and Johnson says, you know, look, similarly, right, what happens before a being comes into existence or what happens after it ceases to exist, those are just not morally relevant. They're not relevant to whether that being is worthy of moral consideration and respect. OK, so let's grant that personites have moral status, um, just as persons do. Uh, so what? Right. Like, what? Why would that be a problem? Well, Johnston says that this is going to have significant consequences for practical reason and morality. So let's start with practical reason. We are often willing to make sacrifices in the short term to gain some longer term benefit. I hate exercising. I, mean, I really truly hate it, but I, I'm willing to put myself through the misery of exercising because I, I hope it will increase my chances of having a longer, healthier life. Uh, similarly, I want to gorge on chocolate cake I mean, I really want to do that. I want to just take a massive chocolate cake and stuff the whole thing in my mouth. But I'm willing to restrain myself and follow a healthier, more boring diet because I want to live a long life. It has a long term benefit. Um, Johnston gives the example of moving to Budapest in three months and learning Hungarian before leaving. Um, the process of learning Hungarian, he says, is agonizing, but he does it because he expects that knowing Hungarian will significantly improve his time in Budapest. Okay, so here's the problem then. I know that when I get to Budapest, I will reap the rewards of the unpleasant time spent learning Hungarian. But I also know that there are many personites who also 
underwent this frustration of learning Hungarian, who will never reap the rewards. Um, uh, you know, that, that because they will cease to exist before I move to Budapest. So if I decide to learn Hungarian, I will be making those Personites take part in a project that benefits me, but which imposes a significant cost on them, and for which they never receive any compensation. And that seems morally problematic. <coughs> those Personites are being used as a mere means to my ends. And if this is right, it seems that I'm morally required to avoid prudential sacrifices, right? You know, I'm morally required to avoid doing something that incurs a cost now for a benefit later, because those prudential sacrifices, they don't just impose a cost on me, they impose a cost on these countless personites. Those personites are never compensated, they never receive the benefit. And that seems uh, morally problematic, right? It seems like you shouldn't treat people that way. Now, there's an obvious objection to all of this, which is it overlooks consent. So if I choose to make a sacrifice in order to gain a greater benefit later, then all of those personites are making the same choice because the personites have exactly the same thoughts and feelings that I do. They're not being forced into anything. They are freely choosing to make the sacrifice along with me. Unfortunately, things aren't quite so straightforward. So what's happening here is I'm making a judgment along these lines. I'm saying, oh, I will incur I will incur cost X now in order to gain benefit later. So, you know, this is what I believe, right? I believe that I am going to bear some short-term pain, but I choose to do so because I expect there will be a reward. Now, consider a personite who came into existence when I was born and will cease to exist in three months before I move to Budapest. This personite obviously believes the same thing as me. The personite believes... I will incur cost X now in order to gain benefit later. Like, whatever, you know, whatever thoughts and feelings I have, the Personites have the same, right? So the Personite believes the same thing. Okay, the Personite believes I will incur cost X now in order to gain benefit later. Now, there are two interpretations of this Personite's belief. So, on one interpretation, when the Personite believes I will incur cost X now in order to gain benefit a while later, the I refers to the person, right? Um, but in that case, the personite's belief is clearly just false, because the personite will never receive the benefit later. The personite cannot possibly receive the benefit later. Uh, the reason why the personite holds this false belief is because he is mistaken about the nature of his identity. Um, so. You know, so so he's he's wrong, right? Actually, he is misled. Um, he is he is under a delusion. There is an alternative view here, which is to say, well, when the personite believes I will incur cost X now in order to gain benefit Y later, perhaps the I refers to me, the person, not the personite. So that so yeah, the I, I picks out. So the the term I is an indexical that picks out persons, doesn't pick out personites. So perhaps we simply don't have a tool in our language and our conventional thinking to refer to personites. In that case, the personites' belief is not false, because the personites correctly, right, believing that the person will incur cost X now to gain benefit Y later. But the personite is still mistaken in a very important sense. The problem for the personite is that he has, <coughs> he has no means to refer to himself. So he doesn't even have any beliefs about himself. He's not, he's not even able to form beliefs about himself. He's not able to consider his own interests. So the point of this then is that, okay, in some sense, the personite has the same preferences as me, but these preferences are based on, on error or ignorance. Uh, the personite certainly doesn't share my interests. So when this personite consents to making the sacrifice, it's not because he's altruistically choosing to sacrifice his interests for my sake. Rather, he's under the illusion that his interests are the same as my interests. So if this person might consent, it's very hard to see how it could be appropriately informed consent. I mean, look at it this way. If I knew that I would cease to exist in three months, like let's say I knew that, you know, in three months I'm going to get hit by a bus and killed. Well, you know, in that case, I'm never going to make it to Budapest. And if I knew that, I would obviously not bother learning Hungarian. Right? I wouldn't bother putting myself through this frustration for nothing. 
Well, the same is true for the Personites, because the Personites have the same thoughts and feelings that I do. But many of those Personites really will cease to exist in three months. The problem that these Personites have is that they don't know who they really are. They're not aware that they will cease to exist in three months. So they have false beliefs about what their interests are, or maybe they just don't have any beliefs at all about what their interests are. But at the very least, it seems morally questionable for me to exploit their ignorance. They cannot give informed consent. The fact that we express our thoughts with the term I, which refers to persons, disguises the interests of personites. So here's a sort of standard kind of practical reasoning. You know, like I, I'm thinking about this move to Budapest, and here's how I reason. I say... Oh yeah, I reasonably intend to move to Budapest this summer, right? Like, this is something I can do. Um, so, you know, it, it, and then I know it would be helpful to me if upon arriving I could talk to the locals in their native tongue. And the benefits of this are going to outweigh the agony of learning Hungarian. So, I intend to learn Hungarian. I form the intention to learn Hungarian. But now we could introduce a new term, we hear. Um, so, Johnston says, okay, could, like, take this term, we hear. And by definition... Whenever we hear is uttered, it refers to all of the persons and personites that include, you know, that, that at the time that it is uttered, basically. So we hear helps to draw attention to the interests of personites. And now think about the following kind of practical reasoning. Uh, we here reasonably intend to move to Budapest this summer. It will be helpful to we here if upon arriving, we here could talk to the locals in their native tongue. The benefits of this would outweigh the agony of learning Hungarian, so we here intend to learn Hungarian. Well, this reasoning is just obviously crazy. Uh, you know, premise one is clearly false because many of the Personites cannot reasonably intend to move to Budapest this summer. They will definitely cease to exist before the summer. You know, it would be, it would be like me intending to buy a farm on Fiji in three million years. Against premises two and three, the Personites who will not make it to Budapest will obviously not gain any benefit from learning Hungarian. So if you reason in this way, I mean, it's, it's just clearly flawed. Um, and we here will not form the intention to learn Hungarian. I mean, at least not on the basis of this reasoning. Um, you know, so if we thought in ways that appropriately considered the interests of Personites, we would never make prudential sacrifices. <coughs> Further problems emerge when we consider later stage Personites, Personites who come into existence at... Uh, a later stage in a person's life. There is the personite who comes into existence when I wake up tomorrow morning. Now this is going to threaten prudential reasoning where I choose a great benefit now over a minor sacrifice later. Suppose I decide to stay up late partying. I know that I'm going to have a hangover tomorrow, I'm going to feel a bit tired and miserable, but you know I decide, you know what, it's no big deal, it's worth the trade. My hangovers don't tend to be particularly bad, they don't tend to last too long, and this is an excellent party. I mean, it really is a brilliant party, and it's been so long since I've really let my hair down and had a, had a you know, good time like this. So I, I decide to make the trade. I just choose, yep, I'm going to have this great benefit, this great party now, um, in exchange for that minor cost of the hangover later. But now consider the personites who come into existence when I wake up tomorrow morning. I'm, I'm imposing a cost on them, and they never receive any benefit. And moreover, this is a cost to which they definitely never consented, because unlike the case of making sacrifices now for future gains, there's no plausible argument that these later personites are freely choosing to bear this cost. I decide now to impose a cost on them in the future. They don't even exist yet, so they have no say in the matter. Again... This seems morally questionable. So, uh, it looks like practical reasoning, you know, weighing up costs and benefits over our own lives, uh, this becomes questionable, at least, at least questionable, given the existence of personites. Once we consider the interests of personites, practical reasoning loses its force. Um, there are many other aspects to our, our lives that are threatened. Um, particularly the sorts of moral judgments we make um, and how we interact with others. So uh, we will very often impose costs on other people because we say it's for their own good in the long run. We force our children to go to school or to have good diets or to visit the dentist. Even though things might, these things might cause them considerable distress, 
We do this because, however much the children might hate these things at the time, we expect it will improve their lives in the long run. Given the personite problem, this is morally wrong. By forcing children to go to school, you're forcing many personites to endure a great deal of frustration and misery for no benefit whatsoever. By forcing them to visit the dentist, you're forcing them to undergo medical procedures that they cannot possibly benefit from. So we're subjecting very, so we're subjecting countless beings to medical procedures that they do not want and that they cannot benefit from. That seems, that seems a bit problematic, doesn't it? <laughs> Um, similarly then, almost all forms of punishment are going to become morally wrong. Suppose that Verity murders Sidney, and later Verity is sentenced to imprisonment. But in addition to imprisoning Verity, we're imprisoning countless personites who overlap with Verity, and who are innocent of the crime since they came into existence after the crime was committed. The personite, who came into existence one month after the murder, had nothing to do with the murder. In a very literal sense, all forms of punishment are collective punishment. All forms of punishment will punish not just the person who committed the crime, but countless personites, many of whom will be innocent of the crime. Or think about um, contracts. Contracts are enforced on personites who did not exist when the contract was signed. How can they be held responsible for fulfilling a contract that they never signed, that they never consented to? Or take promising. When I make a promise to perform a particular action in the future, there will later come into existence many personites who never made the promise. Uh, they have to bear the cost of fulfilling the promise, but they never made the promise. That seems that seems unfair. Um, so, so now it looks like I shouldn't be signing contracts or making promises. These activities illegitimately impose a burden on personites who never even existed when the contract or promise was made. This is the personite problem. Our standard ways of thinking about practical reason and morality are put into serious jeopardy if, pers if you know, given the existence of personites. Okay, so what might we say in response to this? Well, I mean, one option, and I suppose the common sense option, is just to deny that personites exist. If there are no personites, there's no personite problem. But why? Like, why should, why should we say that personites don't exist? <coughs> I mean, prima facie, this has strange consequences, because, you know, like if you take my life up to the age of 30, well, that's a personite. And if you say that personite doesn't exist, then what are we saying? That my life up to the age of 30 never happened? Um, perhaps, though, the issue is this. Perhaps personites are not uh, genuine objects, or they're not, like, natural objects, or they're not natural kinds or some sense. So, <coughs> personites... <coughs> If they exist, they exist only in some sort of derivative or artificial sense. And so one thought here might be, when we say that a personite exists, what we're doing is we're just arbitrarily stipulating a boundary where there actually is none in nature. As I am speaking these sentences, an indefinite number of personites cease to exist. But that seems totally arbitrary, because there are no significant changes in the biological or psychological states that are occurring as I'm speaking these sentences. Personites, then, are not genuine objects because their boundaries are arbitrary. Okay, so there's a few responses to this. First of all, I mean, it's not obvious that there actually is any arbitrariness here because what we're saying is that there is a personite for every stage and every sum of continuous stages of a person's life. It would be one thing if we were to select just one of these personites, say the personite that came into existence when I was born and ceased to exist when I was 30, and we say, oh, this particular personite is real, but none of the others are. That would be weirdly arbitrary. But the view in question says there's a personite for any line we might draw, and none of these personites is metaphysically privileged. They're all real. And I think that's, that's less obviously arbitrary. So, like, yeah, if you focus on just one personite, then when it goes out of existence maybe looks arbitrary. But if you consider, you know, all of the personites, they're sort of, it's just like any any part of a person's life counts as a personite. That doesn't seem so arbitrary. Okay, second point. Let's say we focus on just one specific personite. So, okay, it is odd to say that, that a being of moral significance goes out of existence even though there have been no notable biological or psychological changes. But the problem is that sometimes there actually are such changes. So consider the personite who came into existence when I woke up this morning and will cease to exist just as I fall asleep. This personite exists for the continuous period when I'm awake. There's a continuous 
uninterrupted stream of waking consciousness, which is bookended by what are actually quite different biological and psychological states. And, and now that doesn't seem arbitrary at all, right? Like, where's the arbitrariness there? I mean, there are significant biological and psychological changes that accompany its coming into existence and ceasing to exist. So even if you can, say, even if you can get rid of, you know, some of the personites um, by appealing to arbitrariness, it looks like you're not going to get rid of all of them. Um, a third problem here is that persons also have arbitrary boundaries. Um, I mean, it's not at all obvious that persons are natural kinds or genuine objects in the sense that's being demanded of personites. What is a person? Well, I, I mean, there are many ways of defining personhood, but, you know, generally we take it that persons are conscious, that they're capable of thinking and feeling, they're capable of reflecting on their actions, capable of forming connections with others and so on. All of these capacities develop gradually. I mean, certainly from a naturalist point of view, we, we wouldn't say that a zygote is a person. It has the potential to become a person, but it's not a person right now. Um, then, you know, a toddler, once you get to sort of about 12 months old, well, that's clearly a person. But there's a very long period of gradual development where, you know, there isn't a point at which we can just draw the line and say, oh, yeah, that's the person. Um, I, I mean, is the fetus at 30 months a person? What about the infant at two weeks after birth? And uh, certainly, you know, like an infant at two weeks, okay, this is a, an entity that is worthy of moral consideration. But is it like an actual person? I mean, it's not obvious, right? It's, it's so there's there's a long, there's a lot of stages here that are just unclear. And so, you know, the line is arbitrary. There's actually uh, a more general issue with the response that personalites don't exist. So, even if we can defend the claim that personites don't exist or that personites are not genuine objects or whatever, that in itself doesn't actually solve the personite problem. And to see why, um, consider mirological nihilism. According to mirological nihilism, there are no composite objects. The mirological nihilist says that no two objects ever compose a further object. All that really exists, according to the mirological nihilist, are fundamental particles arranged in various ways. So, strictly speaking, there are no persons. <coughs> I have a video on um, ordinary objects and philosophical problems with ordinary objects, which I'll link in the comments, and that outlines some of the motivations for mirological nihilism. Um, but anyway, yeah, the mirological nihilist says, strictly speaking, there are no persons. Now, at least initially, you might think, oh, that's going to have radical consequences for morality and practical reason. If people don't exist, I can never harm another person. If I don't exist, you know, I can never benefit or harm myself. But most mirological nihilists do not think that mirological nihilism has these has, has consequences that are so radical, because what they'll say is, well, sure, you know, there are no persons, but look, there are still particles arranged person-wise. And, you know, there are still some arrangements of particles that are good and some arrangements of particles that are bad. It's still worth promoting arrangements of particles that would conventionally be labelled happiness and arrangements of particles that would conventionally be labelled suffering or sadness. Um, and when we talk about persons, that's a convenient fiction. You know, within that fiction, we still have moral commitments. Um, even though persons don't exist, we should still think as if there were persons and we should still, you know, like act as if there were. We should still respect the rights of persons, even though persons don't exist. Um, so, <coughs> in principle, then, it seems like we could take a similar view of personites. You could grant that personites don't exist. Well, you know, maybe talk of personites is just a convenient fiction for expect expressing more complicated underlying facts, right? Yeah, there are no personites, sure, but there's still stages of a person's life and different arrangements of stages of a person's life and you know maybe these generate moral commitments in the same way that personites would so to respond to the personite problem it's not enough just in itself to say the personites don't exist <laughs> okay so an alternative sort of view here is uh, approach here is we might grant that personites exist but then deny that they matter so why should we think personites don't matter well one idea is that maximality is necessary for moral status. Persons have moral status and personites do not because persons satisfy the maximality criterion. 
Persons are maximal sums of person stages, whereas personites are not. On this view, the moral status of a being does depend on what happens before and after that being exists. It is precisely because uh, these relations of biological and psychological continuity continue before or after the personite exists. It's precisely because of that that the personite does not matter. Of course, the question here is, well, why? Right? Why would maximality matter so much? Um, I mean, in a way, this just seems like a slightly more technical way of saying that personites are not persons. Uh, you know, they're not persons precisely because they're not maximal sums of person stages. But again, all of the features of persons that we would normally take as conferring moral status are also held by personites. And, you know, if you look at the literature that discusses, well, what features are necessary for a being to have moral status? I don't think anyone has ever appealed to maximality before. So appealing to maximality in this context just seems kind of ad hoc, you know, to say, well, personalites don't matter because they're not maximal <laughs> sums. Um, that's That looks uh, ad hoc. Another thought is that personalites are dependent on persons in some important way that renders them morally insignificant. It's a bit hard to make this idea precise, but here's what we might say. So personites have whatever thoughts, feelings, and goals that they do only because I have or at least my, so the personites in my body have whatever thoughts, feelings, and goals they do, only because I have those thoughts, feelings, and goals. Those thoughts, feelings, and goals are mine in some important way. Personites, maybe you can say they have those thoughts, feelings, and goals, but only in some derivative sense. Like, let's say I form the goal of moving to Budapest. Various personites will form that goal at the same time, but only because I have formed that goal. Indeed, their goal is literally identical to mine their thought is identical to mine. Or let's say that I commit some crime and you punish me. This causes a great deal of distress. Many personites will also feel the distress, but only because I feel that distress. That distress is my distress. So we might say that personites, they never really think or feel or suffer. Um, personites, if they have mental states, they're more like sort of mirrors of my own mental states or something like that. They don't really have their own minds. Okay, there's a couple of concerns with this. First of all, if anything, it seems like there's just a strong reason for thinking that the, the dependence goes the other way. That the person is the way that they are and the person has the thoughts and feelings and goals they do because of the personites that constitute them. It seems that persons are literally made up of personites. And consider that, you know, I could alter the person without altering many of the personites. If I had died on my 30th birthday, this would... You know, this would change various facts about Cain Baker, the person. But again, if I died on my 30th birthday, all the facts about the personites that ceased to exist prior to that time would remain unchanged. Um, so, you know, I mean, so look, I mean, we might say, hey, persons are just made up of personites. It's persons that are derivative, that are dependent, not personites. A second issue is that, as with the previous response, it's not clear why this kind of dependence would make any moral difference. Uh, the idea is that you know, if the mental states of one being are dependent on or derivative from the mental states of another being, then only the, you know, only that other being matters. But why? I mean, that, again, it just seems kind of ad hoc, unmotivated. Um, so suppose, here's a, 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 a thought experiment, suppose it turns out that the world is a sophisticated simulation and aliens can plug themselves into this simulation and they can experience what it's like to live in our world. So our world is basically a very sophisticated video game that aliens can plug themselves into. Um, so, you know, in other words, there was some alien who plugged itself into the simulation. And at that point, at the point it plugged itself in, all of its memories, beliefs, goals, desires were wiped. And instead, it's simulated to, you know, it's kind of loaded with a, a set of uh, other beliefs, goals and desires, such as, you know, a love of philosophy, an interest in Doctor Who and free improvisation and so on, you know, and it and it grows up, lives and dies in this simulation. Once it dies in the simulation, its time in the simulation ends and it goes back to being as it was before, though now it has the knowledge of what it's like to live, uh, you know, as a philosophy YouTuber on planet Earth. Um, so, you know, in this story, Cain Baker's experience or consciousness is derivative uh, on the alien's experience or consciousness, right? Like the it's 
so in a sense, I'm actually an alien, and I actually, ha I mean, Kane Baker doesn't really exist. Um, you know, <laughs> Kane, Kane Baker isn't real. I'm actually this alien that has a completely different psychology, um, a psychology that's unimaginable to me. Um, but it seems like Kane Baker still matters, right? Like you can't just do whatever you want to Kane Baker. Kane Baker is still a a being worthy of moral consideration and respect, and so on. Um, and so, if that's right, then it seems like you know, this dependence is is not of obvious moral relevance. <laughs> um, okay then, a final option in responding to the personite problem is that there are some moral theories on which the personite problem simply doesn't arise. So, the most notable one of these is hedonistic utilitarianism. For a hedonistic utilitarian, persons don't matter at all. All that matters is the overall sum of pleasure and pain. The hedonistic utilitarian aims to increase overall pleasure and reduce overall pain, and that's it. That's all that matters. There's nothing wrong with imposing a massive cost on one being without consent and without compensation, provided this maximizes pleasure overall. Um, so, it, it, so like, yeah, the it, all that the utilitarian is looking at is just how much pleasure is there, how much pain is there, and that's all. Now, the personite problem arises because we think that there are constraints on how we can treat morally significant beings. We usually assume that we should respect people's interests and we can't use people as a mere means to some further end. Uh, one way to phrase this is, well, there are morally significant beings with rights, with the right to life, the right to, you know, uh, choose their own path, the right not to be exploited, and so on. So... The issue with prudential sacrifices is going to rest on this point that it uses personites as a means to the end of benefiting the person. Um, similarly, you know, the issue with punishment is, oh, well, you know, you're, you're, you're punishing innocent personites, right? Uh, there's these countless beings that have not committed the crime. You know they've not committed the crime, but you're punishing them anyway. And that seems to violate their rights. But for the utilitarian, there are no general rules like this. There are no rights, strictly speaking. The utilitarian doesn't care about persons or personites. Uh, she only cares about pleasures and pains. Um, so, you know, so, so basically the thought is, well, if persons have rights, so do personites. But for the utilitarian, even persons don't have rights. So it's fine to make prudential sacrifices because this will increase pleasure in the long run. It's fine to punish people and personites for crimes even though many of them will be innocent, because the system of criminal punishment increases pleasure in the long run. It helps to promote a stable, peaceful, well-functioning society. Um, and, you know, one thing to bear in mind here is, you know, a lot of people already endorse utilitarianism. Um, and for utilitarianism, the personite problem is just not a problem. So maybe then the, you know, if we kind of grant the existence of personites, maybe the, the damage to moral and prudential thinking would not be so significant. Insofar as utilitarianism conforms to our ordinary moral views, personites are no threat to those views either. Now, of course, I mean, you know, a lot of people have plenty of objections to utilitarianism. Um, maybe it doesn't really conform appropriately to our ordinary moral views. I mean, maybe utilitarianism is, is in itself, you know, a radical departure. Um, but, you know, that's, uh, that's, that is another option for responding to this problem. Okay, well, that is the end of that video. I hope you found that interesting, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye, everybody.